Hi, I'm Fabian, and in this video I'm going to discuss uh, Hegel's Science of Logic, which I'm doing a, a series on. Um, uh, so the, the purpose of, of this uh, video series is to uh, try to help you to read uh, Hegel's Science of Logic. Um, a lot of people think that Hegel's Science of Logic is um, impossible to read. People often think it's it use difficult jargon, uh, a lot of um, big words. Um, in fact, in the 19th century already, Hegel's students complained about this. Um, and since, since Hegel was writing, people have often remarked how difficult and challenging his, uh, his work can be. Um, but the truth is, Hegel's writing is actually uh, quite accessible. Um, it's just that you have to get a hang of the uh, his, of his language and of his method, particularly his, his dialectical method. Um, Hegel is uh, very much within the German philosophical tradition, which is uh, sometimes called the speculative tradition, um, and which prefers a highly abstract philosophical vocabulary and designed to help uh, think through complex philosophical issues. Um, this was a tradition that was begun with Kant um, and continued by Fichte, Schelling, um, and then Hegel. And so with Hegel, uh, the, the key is just getting, uh, getting familiar with his, with his writing and his, his language um, and to really grapple with a, with a text till you sort of feel like you have a sense of what's going on. Um, I think often in philosophy, people, people want to try to understand a text, uh, and they put that as their kind of goal. They want to understand Hegel, or they want to understand Spinoza. Um, but I don't think that's the right way to approach Hegel. Uh, with Hegel, you, you shouldn't try to understand the text. Um, I don't think this is what Hegel necessarily would have wanted. Instead, you should try to work through the text and see if something can come out of uh, an engagement with it. Um, and, and this is indeed how writers, particularly Karl Marx, uh, uh, approached Hegel's uh, writing, was uh, to, to see what could be gained from uh, a serious engagement with his text, as opposed to trying to understand what he said. Um, to take Hegel and to do something unique with, with Hegel. So I think the best way to read him is just to sort of go through and really think about the words, try to feel the words, um, and see if, if something comes up for you when you read the words. If you, for example, hear Hegel using words like immediate being or uh, a mediated reflexive understanding, you know, these kind of big words, deal with the text and see what kind of comes up for you. Try to focus, focus on what's going on in, inside of your mind and maybe write that down. Do a kind of what, what kind of um, uh, Freud would have called a sort of free free uh, associations, um, and this this will help you to sort of uh, get engaged with with Hegel as opposed to just trying to understand what he said. Um, I think also with Hegel, it's a good idea to um, to really take time to focus on a, a paragraph. So instead of having your goal like, oh, I want to read a whole chapter of Hegel today, or even a whole section, maybe it's better just to read a page of Hegel and to really see what, what can be gained from engaging with, uh, with, with, that, uh, uh, with that page. Um, now, before I begin with the, the science of logic, which is going to be the focus of this series, um, I want to focus on why one might read Hegel. I mean, given the sheer difficulty of, of the writing, why would anyone want to spend time? Well, one reason is um, that Hegel developed what was known, came to be known as the dialectical method. And uh, many philosophers, uh, from Plato to Spinoza to, uh, to Kant, all engaged with dialectics and used dialectics. But in Hegel's writing, we get a clear, systematic, expression of dialectical thinking. In Hegel, you don't just get an analysis of what dialectics is, you get to do dialectics by um, interacting with, with Hegel's 
writing. So uh, to, to read Hegel is therefore also to engage with uh, dialectical thinking, to become a dialectician. Um, another reason one might read Hegel, of course, is if one is uh, particularly interested in, in Marxism, which was, of course, what brought me to Hegel, um, was my great passion for uh, Marx's capital. Now, um, you may have heard that um, Marx uh, stood Hegel on his head, that he took Hegel and he turned him around. And, well, he did a lot more than that. He actually took Hegel and he uh, used Hegelian dialectics to expose the process by which uh, categories within political economy and social thought are produced. So if one reads Capital, a lot of people think if you read Capital, it's just a book about capitalism and the capitalist mode of production. And that if you read Capital, you're going to understand how capitalism works. And indeed, that is partly what Marxist capital is about. But at a more fundamental level, Marx was demonstrating the value of, of Hegelian dialectics for critical uh, analysis. And by critical, uh, is always understood the dialectical deconstruction of concepts, the process by which concepts are formed through a dialectical process. So the, the text that I'm going to be analyzing is uh, Hegel's Science of Logic. This is the um, uh, Murhead Philosophy Library text. Uh, it's the edition translated by A.V. Miller. I think it's fairly widely available. I have the hardcover here, but the book is fairly widely available uh, on, online. Um, and what I want to spend a little bit of time discussing is the first major section called, uh, in book one, The Doctrine of Being, um, where Hegel raises the question with what must the science begin? And um, this, this chapter um, of, of the science of logic uh, raises the question of the beginning. Where must we begin if we are to uh, do philosophy in a way that uh, uh, clearly expresses the truth. Um, and indeed, this was one of Hegel's main occupations, was Hegel thought that philosophy concerns itself with truth, and that to be a philosopher means to be someone who aspires after the truth. And Hegel thought that the only way you're going to get to the truth is if you uh, define the proper beginning, the proper place for which thought must begin. Um, now, beginnings has a very long historical significance, both in uh, philosophy, but also in uh, religion and theology. Um, if one reads uh, the Old Testament, the Bible, uh, one will see there, too, the, the, the uh, Genesis beginning with the discussion about um, in the beginning. Um, and there are this, there's the clear creation narrative of the process by which uh, God produced the, and created the world. Um, there's a clear understanding of the beginning as a space of nothingness out of which everything sort of comes. And later on in the New Testament, in John, uh, we also hear a discussion of the beginning. There the beginning is formulated as the logos. Um, and the logos, in John's understanding, becomes uh, is incarnated, um, in his case, in the Christian understanding, in the form of Jesus. Um, in some ways, there's a there's a uh, understanding that the beginning goes from nothing and ends up, in this case, with um, a determinate being, namely, in this case, Jesus. And this is very much also what Hegel is going to do. Um, there in the beginning is is very much something that's an object of reflection, um, and a clear there's a clear starting point from which thought begins its um, its its process. And we also see beginnings in the work of Spinoza, um, who very much believed that if one is to do philosophy, one must begin with clear definitions. And in his understanding, a definition is something that expresses a thing's generative essence. Um, a generative essence is an expression of the process by which a thing comes into being. So for Spinoza, for example, if you want to define a circle, what is the true, true definition of a circle? Well, it's essentially 
uh, a, a formula that tells you how to draw a circle. You take your compass and you make a 360 degree sphere. Spinoza thought this was a true definition because it expresses the process by which a circle comes into being. And from there, one can then deduce all of the properties of a circle, as opposed to maybe beginning with particular uh, accidents of the circle, the fact that it's circular or that it has um, certain mathematical features like circumference. Um, Spinoza thought that a, cl a clear definition of, of a circle expressing its generative essence would allow us to understand all those accidents, but also the thing's essence. So there's an understanding there that beginnings are important. Um, and so in, uh, in um, Hegel, this beginning is also uh, clearly understood to be in a very important uh, s uh, starting point. Now, I'll just summarize what's going to happen, and then I'll dig directly into the text. In Hegel's understanding, the beginning is um, what he's going to call uh, immediate being. Um, and the important term here is the term immediacy. Now, in, um, in Hegelian thought, Im immediacy essentially means that something is not mediated. <laughs> what that means is that it doesn't have a whole uh, structure of connections or systems or uh, connecting moments um, by which a thing exists. Um, also, uh, something is immediate in the sense that uh, nothing else is said of the thing except the thing itself. Um, the thing's immediacy uh, also expresses how a thing appears without anything else being added to it. Um, and in his case, pure immediate being is being, but being which has not yet been determined by any particular qualities or features. It's just being and nothing else than being. Um, and as he's going to show, this is a very impoverished uh, kind of abstraction. When you begin with pure immediate being, and you start to think about, well, what is pure immediate being? Pure immediate being um, is indifferentiated. There's no other to which being could be compared, because it's, if there was an other to which being could be compared, then it would already be mediated. Um, its mediation uh, is expressed through its relationship to an other, and indeed, what is the other of being? Well, nothing or non-being. But Hegel says, we can't begin with being insofar as it occupies a particular relation to something else. If I try to think about being in relation to non-being, then I've already made a sort of assumption that non-being is the absence of being, and I've already assumed the concept of absence. And Hegel wants to begin with a beginning that's so simple in which no such assumptions are made. So that's the, that's the idea. And a part of what Hegel kind of wants to, wants to articulate here is that the beginning from which philosophy begins, and in his case, the science of logic, um, must begin within the science itself. Um, and indeed, in Hegel, Hegel uses the term science, uh, Wissenschaft. Uh, Wissenschaft means, um, it's, it's the German term for science, but it doesn't, isn't really the way we understand science today. I mean, when we hear the word science, we tend to think about it in terms of the empirical, experimental sciences um, that generally require some level of experimentation. This was not the case in Hegel's time. In Hegel's time, science was still very much used to express a sort of systematicity. Something is scientific when it's systematic, when it's clearly conceptually defined from within a system of concepts. Um, so it's not science in the way we would use it. Um, more of the uh, probably proper term would be a discourse, a particular discourse. Um, and what Hegel's trying to articulate thus is that the beginning from which logic begins is um, must begin from within the science of logic. Um, now Hegel articulates himself within the history of logic. He's here writing in the 19th century, I think the 1820s is when he writes uh, the science of logic, and there's already a whole bunch of people that came before him, uh, particularly Plato and Aristotle, or two of his great kind of mm, kind of predecessors, but also many of the um, medieval um, scholastic philosophers, both the Catholic ones like Thomas Aquinas, 
and the um, Islamic ones that um, uh, revived many of the Aristotelian notions that were for many years lost in, in, uh, in Western Europe. Um, and Hegel tries to more or less articulate himself um, within this uh, domain. Um, and so, uh, right, I'm going to turn now to the text, and my approach is going to actually be to just read the text and then more or less comment on it. I don't plan to read the entire thing, just the parts that I have sort of um, highlighted. And uh, so here we begin in the, 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 with what must the science begin. And he begins here at the very beginning. This is uh, page 67 in the AV Nova translation. It is only in recent times that thinkers have become aware of the difficulty of finding a beginning in philosophy and the reason for this dif difficulty and also the possibility of resolving it has been much discussed. What philosophy begins with must be either mediated or immediate, and it is easy to show that it can be neither the one nor the other. Thus, either way of beginning is refuted. So um, actually what Hegel's going to show here is that the beginning from which philosophy, and particularly the logic, must begin is both immediate, it deals with pure immediate being, but at the same time, it's also going to contain mediation. And what Hegel's going to show is that the mediated features of being themselves more or less crystallize and, and appear when one reflects abstractly on the concept of immediate being. Um, so he's going to say it's both immediate and mediated. But more importantly, Hegel also, because um, I didn't look at the introductions or the prefaces. I plan to do that in a different video. But what Hegel actually wants to say here is that logic actually begins with uh, the results from which he developed his book, uh, The Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, the, and essentially, it's uh, spirit is this kind of term, he, geist, it's this term, it means, uh, not, it means spirit or a spiritual force or thought. Um, it essentially expresses the... Um, internal mental processes by which human beings produce philosophy, culture, political systems. Um, spirit is, for, for Hegel, not something individual, but is a sort of collective thing. In Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, he shows the process by which thought itself develops through a whole series of contradictions and mediating links. And the beginning the mediated element of the beginning is the fact that spirit itself is the um, the spirit that begins with logic is this being for which its very own being has already been uh, mediated through a whole entire historical process that preceded it. And this mediated historical process is precisely analyzed in his phenomenology of spirit. So Hegel says, um, further along the same page, page 67, the, philosophy, the principle of a philosophy does, of course, also express a beginning, but not so much as subjective as an objective one, the beginning of everything. The principle is a particular determinate content, water, the one, moose, idea, substance, monad, or if it refers to the nature of cognition and consequently is supposed to be only a criterion rather than an objective determination, thought, intuition, sensation, ego, subjectivity itself. And so what Hegel here is saying is that um, you know, the very principles from which philosophers have begun assume already a certain beginning. And so we have here water. And it's talking about the pre-Socratic philosophers in ancient Greece. Some of them said that water is the principle of everything, and that everything is essentially water silly thing to say today, but this was um, very much believed by certain Greek philosophers. Um, the one, um, right? You see this in, in Plato, is the idea of the forms, um, the ideas, which are a sort of universality that stand beyond every single particular thing that exists. And so you have here like a universal idea for beauty, um, and it exists in some abstract kind of metaphysical heaven, 
And every particular beautiful object, whether a beautiful piece of music by uh, a composer like Mendelssohn, I have here a picture of Mendelssohn, the great um, German uh, 19th century composer. You have Mendelssohn's first symphony and you hear it, oh, it's very beautiful, it sounds very nice, I very much like this piece, it sounds so beautiful. Plato would say that you're experiencing the symphony as beautiful because when you, uh, before you were born, your soul interacted with the form of the beautiful itself. Um, and that form of the beautiful is what makes every particular beautiful thing you hear beautiful. So if you hear a beautiful classical music from Mendelssohn or Schubert, for example, it's because you already experienced beauty as such um, prior to your birth. And, um, and so for Plato, the beginning of philosophy begins precisely when one asks, what, is, what does it mean for something to be beautiful? And when thought transcends beyond particular beautiful symphonies by Mendelssohn, for example, to the abstract um, forms that give beauty itself its life and, and vitality. So this is what Hegel's talking about here. And he's pointing out that this principle itself assumes a sort of beginning, that philosophy must begin from the form um, itself. Um, uh, well, there's other ones here. Substance, he's talking about Spinoza. Monads, he's talking about Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz thought that there were uh, an infinite amount of little monads flying around, essentially kind of like atoms. Um, and every single thing had a sort of monad. And um, the purpose of philosophy was to connect with this sort of infinite mon monadality of things. That's the idea. It's kind of a silly idea. Um, and then, of course, he's talking here about ego, and he's engaging here with Descartes, who Descartes, you know, in his t famous meditation says, uh, cogito ergo sum, you know, the, the cogito, the I think, um, is the beginning place for Descartes, um, because if one can be certain that one's thinking, then one can also be certain that one exists. It's from the thinking that one performs that one deduces one's existence. And this is thus the beginning place from which Descartes begins his sort of analysis. Um, uh, subjectivity itself, here he's talking about Kant or, and, and also Descartes, who both assumed that the place from which every single analysis must begin is subjectivity, the internal process of consciousness by which consciousness um, engages with the world and becomes aware of its sensations, becomes aware of its thoughts, um, and on the basis of that awareness deduces all sorts of truths and perhaps the truth. So this is, this is Hegel, Hegel's thing, is that the beginning is already assumed in each of these philosophical um, interactions. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Um, Hegel points out that he wants to know what, what is the truth, and he thinks that these beginnings, whether Plato's idea or Spinoza's substance or Descartes' cogito, that these beginnings, because they don't start with the right beginning, ultimately will fail to gain the absolute truth. And that's really Hegel's goal, is to get to the totality of truth. And you can't really do that, according to Hegel, if you didn't, if you're only, um, getting sort of partial truths. Um, so, um, so Hegel says, if earlier abstract thought was interested in the principle only as content, but in the course of philosophical development has been impelled to pay attention to the other side, to the behavior of the cognitive process, this implies that the subjective act has also been grasped as an essential moment of objective truth and this brings with it the need to unite the method with the content, the form with the principle. Thus the principle ought also to be the beginning, and what is the first the thought also to be the first in the process of thinking. Now what, what is Hegel um, trying, trying to say here? Um, Hegel is saying here that the method of thinking is as important as the principle from which thought begins. So if one's principle, for example, is Descartes' I'm thinking and hence subjectivity, well, that itself is a beginning, but part of what is also the beginning is the method. 
And Hegel here wants to articulate that the dialectical method expresses the content by which the principle of thought itself uh, moves forward to greater um, expressions of truth um, and so forth. So that's the idea. And Hegel, the method is going to be dialectical. Um, now, uh, he says the, the, the beginning has to be logical. Um, and this logical beginning is going to involve what he calls pure knowing, pure knowing. Um, and what is pure knowing? Pure knowing is thought that is free and for itself. It's a thought uh, that has essentially freed itself from any particular concrete features in order to enter an abstract thinking space, but from within that abstract thinking space, transcend to the concrete and to sort of deduce the concrete. That is what Hegel wants to do here. Um, and one of his critiques of Kant is that Kant, unfortunately, never went beyond the abstract universality of thought. Part of what Hegel wants to uh, equip you with is what he calls concrete universality. He wants to discover a universality which is abstract, but expressed through the concrete. A content which has no existence independent of its form. That's a major Hegelian idea, that content has no existence independent of its form. And um, if you have the right method, then you can unite form with content. Um, and his critique of Kant is precisely that he didn't unite form with content. He articulated a content that was abstract, that was universal um, in his book, The Critique of Pure Reason. But this abstract universality never left the space of abstract thought. And Hegel's critique of Kant is that that's precisely because he didn't begin with the proper beginning. He didn't begin with the right place. Um, uh, right, so I'm going to read here from Hegel. I'm going to skip a little bit down. He says, there is nothing in heaven or in nature or mind or anywhere else which does not equally contain both immediacy and mediation so that these two determinations reveal themselves to be unseparated and inseparable and the opposition between them to be a nullity. So uh, um, there's nothing in heaven or nature that doesn't contain both immediacy and mediation. Again, essentially this is a way of saying the content of a thing um, has no existence independent of the forms to which it's attached. Um, the immediate uh, expression of a thing uh, finds its content through its mediated interaction with its form. The form is what allows it to mediate itself. Um, so, th so this is going to be important in Hegel's sort of beginning, is to try to begin with something that's immediate, but from out of that, gain the mediations, gain the interlocking system of connections that sort of define the thing. Um, so then Hegel draws the, raises the question, um, what is a science? He says, but to want the nature of cognition clarified prior to the science is to demand that it can be considered outside the science. Outside the science, this cannot be accomplished, at least not in a scientific manner, and such a manner is alone here uh, in place. So Hegel here um, points out that the uh, the the logic the beginning itself must begin from within the science, and this is actually a very deep point, because what Hegel is here trying to define is that every particular um, beginning must begin imminent to a particular discourse. The beginning of logic is imminent to logic itself. It shouldn't begin from outside of the logic, but rather from within itself, from within its already defined system of concepts. Um, in many ways, this is what Marx is going to do as well in Capital. Marx begins Capital with his famous analysis of the commodity. Marx doesn't locate himself outside of political economy. He specifies the very beginning um, by starting with the commodity. For Marx, this is his beginning. He begins with the commodity form. Um, and in his analysis, the commodity form is what he it contains the germ 
that um, contains the entire capitalist mode of production is already contained within this particular notion of the commodity poor. And so it's within the domain of political economy developed by Adam Smith, David Ricardo, uh, Bastiat, uh, Say, these different types of um, political economists um, that developed a whole system of, of, of economic science. Marx begins from within that domain. And this is what Hegel wants to do. And he thinks you must, you must articulate yourself within a particular context. This is essentially what he's trying to say is, without a certain context, we would be thinking in pure abstractions. And indeed, what makes logic mediated, even when it deals with um, immediate being, for example, or purely immediate abstractions, is the mediated context in which it finds itself. Um, it's kind of like Al Suzer, you know, once pointed out that there's no outside of ideology. You know, if you're a, a critical theorist, you don't stand outside of society kind of looking down upon it, you know, this kind of sort of Nietzschean kind of standpoint, you know, the fate, that painting of the guy standing on top of the mountain, kind of looking down upon everyone, thinking how enlightened he is. Um, that's not what, what Hegel's doing. Um, a, a critical theorist must begin from within ideology and break down ideology from within. And it was on that basis, then the, the, the thought will naturally proceed um, along a dialectical path. Okay, I'm gonna read one more paragraph and then I'm gonna stop. And then I'm just gonna continue with more videos. So Hegel says the beginning is logical in that it is to be made in the element of thought that is free and for itself pure knowing. It is mediated because pure knowing is the ultimate absolute truth of consciousness. It is mediated because pure knowing is the ultimate absolute truth of consciousness. So consciousness, Bewusstsein, in Hegel's understanding, is the ultimate absolute truth. And in Hegel's understanding, Thought and being are identical because being itself is entirely um, expressed through thought. Um, the way that Marx sends Hegel on his head is he sort of flips that. Um, thought is itself an expression of being, and everything more or less comes out of being. Um, it doesn't matter, though. You can flip the, the, the analysis, and it works just as good. But the idea here is pure knowing is um, this sort of mediated standpoint um, that expresses the ultimate absolute truth. And really what Hegel's refer he's making a self-reference here. He's saying everything that I did in my phenomenology of spirit, that expresses the absolute truth. Um, not absolute in the sense of, um, absolute in the sense that it's, it's unquestionably true. Um, absolute insofar as it expresses the totality. And that is indeed what Hegel is concerned with. That is why Hegel wants to be scientific. That is why he says he is a system builder is because he wants to articulate the totality. The entire system of concepts and ideas, their interrelations, their mediations. Um, Hegel says, in the introduction, it was remarked that the phenomenology of spirit is the science of consciousness. The exposition of it and the, the, that consciousness has for the result notion of the notion of science, pure knowing. And you see this term, the notion, a lot. Um, essentially, the notion begriff is the German term, uh, begriff, and uh, it's essentially this sort of, think about it as this sort of body of thought. The body of thought, the ever-expanding body of thought, the dynamic sort of conversation between philosophers, theologians, cultural theorists, artists, musicians, all of these things are essentially part of um, absolute uh, uh, knowing, this or, or, or consciousness, this kind of spirit that Hegel talks about. And notion is this sort of abstract, con abstract conceptual truth contained within this kind of conversation of different figures within history. And Hegel then points out logic then has for its presupposition the science of manifested spirit, 
which contains and demonstrates the necessity and so the truth of the standpoint occupied by pure knowing and of its mediation. So logic uh, presupposes manifested spirit. Um, and again, he's making a self-reference here. He's talking about the phenomenology of spirit um, and also the fact that he, Hegel, isn't this absolute knower outside of history, like for, for example, Plato might be, but rather is a, is a situated subject that exists within a particular situation, a particular context. That standpoint of pure knowing always exists within a particular situation, and that's just what Hegel is trying to, trying to say here. In this science of manifested spirit, the beginning is made from empirical sensuous consciousness, and this is immediate knowledge in the strict sense of the world. In that work, there is discussed the significance of this immediate knowledge. Other forms of consciousness, such as the belief in divine truths, inner experience, knowledge through inner revelation, are very ill-fitted to be quoted as examples of immediate knowledge as a, very, as a little reflection would show. So what, what Egel is pointing out here, is extremely important um, in that one begins more or less with appearance, with one's sensuous consciousness, but not in the way that an empiricist might, right? An empiricist might begin with perception or sensation and then on the basis of that deduce sort of abstract properties. Um, that's not what Hegel's doing. Hegel's beginning with an appearance that's immediate, but that itself will internalize a, a negation and thereby create a contradiction. That's what Hegel's kind of doing. Something appears to me that seems to be unitary, that seems to be one, but the moment I reflect on that thing, that thing articulates um, a negation, and from that negation, um, a conflict between the thing and its opposite itself emerges. So we see this method in Marx's Capital, where again, Marx begins with the commodity form. And he begins by thinking, oh, well, commodity has two things. It's use value and exchange value. The use value is something qualitative, mm, defines its utility, what it's good for, um, why someone might want to consume it. Um, but then when I think of a commodity, you think of something that's, that's produced in order to be sold, and hence it also has exchange value, and that exchange value is the negation of use value. One cannot reflect on exchange value without losing use value. Loose value use value vanishes the moment one thinks of the commodity through um, the aspect of exchange value. But at the same time, it retains its use value while disappearing in the conceptual reflection on exchange value. These are the two immediate forms in which the commodity appears. And what Marx will show is that that conflict between use value and exchange value, the exchange value being something quantitative, abstract, you know, exchange value is the relationship between commodity A and commodity B. Um, it's a quantitative relationship of equality. Use value, on the other hand, is the reason why you would want to consume the commodity in the first place, that it serves some human need. Um, whether real or imagined. And these two things are in conflict with each other. And so Marx always says, well, when we look at the commodity form, it appears as a conflict between exchange value and use value. And the actual essence, the resolution of this contradiction, is to be found in value, in the, the, the value form itself. Value, which for Marx is abstract human labor power, resolves the conflict between use value and exchange value. Abstract human labor power contains both of these things, and the actual magnitude of the abstract human labor power is measured by socially necessary labor time in Marx's uh, analysis. The uh, amount of time on average that it would take to produce a commodity within a given set of historical conditions, right? And so this is what um, Hegel is sort of doing here, is he's saying, well, you have to begin with 
sensuous consciousness in that sense, not sensuous consciousness that I begin with what I'm perceiving in the world, but the, the way in which certain forms, abstract forms appear within my kind of sensory field and the way in which these things articulate contradictions. And you can think, you know, of like all sorts of concepts. If you reflect on the concept of, um, you know, I see um, light outside, it's light. Well, Hegel's going to talk about light. And he says that generally when we think about light, we only think about determinate lightness because determinate lightness is the absence of darkness. It's lightness receives its determinate content through the negation of darkness. And light more or less um, su sublates and preserves this darkness within itself. That's the way that he's talking. That's what he means by when he says here, in this science of manifested spirit, the beginning is made from empirical sensuous consciousness. And this is immediate knowledge of the, of the strict sense of the world. That's what, that's what Hegel is talking about. And he kind of shows how this happens in the phenomenology. Um, now Hegel says, um, in the work just mentioned, immediate consciousness is also the first and that which is immediate in the science itself and therefore the presupposition. So immediate consciousness is the mediated presupposition of the science of logic itself and of the phenomenology of spirit. We begin with consciousness and this is its assumption. The point again is there's no outside. There's no universal standpoint from which we can look down upon the world. Um, in other words, human beings aren't God. Um, and I think that's very much what Hegel wants to say is he's very much articulating himself. I mean, he's, he's, he's a religious thinker. And one of the ways he's religious is to, to say that, to articulate that what it means to be a created thing is to have no outside from which one can view the totality but that at the same time, one can articulate a totality through a dialectical process. Human beings have access to the totality through the correct method. But at the same time, we ourselves are part of that totality. There's no outside that we can, that we can stand. That's the idea. Okay, I'm almost finished. And, right, so Hegel says here, in the work just mentioned, immediate con is the presupposition. He says, but in logic, the presupposition is that which has proved itself to be the result of that phenomenological consideration, the idea as pure knowledge. So where the phenomenology of spirit ended, this is where Hegel begins. But this doesn't mean you have to go read the phenomenology of spirit to understand Hegel's science of logic. I actually personally think the science of logic is the best place to begin if you want to understand Hegel. Um, Logic is pure science, that is pure knowledge in the entire range of its development. The entire range of its development, the entire range of one's development, the entire range of thought's development, the entire range in which thought articulates and can articulate itself. But in this said result, this idea has determined itself to be the certainty which has become truth. The certainty which on the one hand no longer has the object over against it, but has internalized it, knows it as its own self, and on the other hand has given up the knowledge of itself and as something confronting the object of which it is only the annihilation, has divested itself of this subjectivity and is at the one with its self-alienation. Okay, what, what is he talking about here? Well, what, what, he's, what he's saying here is that on the one hand, if you begin with Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, then you begin already from a very reflective standpoint by which you've internalized the entire dialectical process. You've more or less internalized the idea, what he calls the idea. But on the other hand, you've given up this knowledge because there's still a sort of non-all. There's still a a uh, place from which you haven't finished. There's still something to be done. Again, Hegel very much articulates himself as a finite, created being that isn't perfect, but, but suffers from the imperfection of not having this per per perfectedness. And to be self-alienated 
to articulate self-alienation is also to begin the process of dialectical thought. To be a dialectician is to be alienated within the very idea that articulates a whole system of contradictions. Um, and hence to conclude, now starting from this determination of pure knowledge, all that is needed to ensure that the beginning remains imminent in its scientific development is to consider or rather ridding oneself of all other reflection and opinions simply to take up what is there before us. Pure knowing as concentrated into this unity has sublated all reference to an other and to mediation. It is without distinction and thus distinctionless, ceasing to be knowledge. What is present is only simple immediacy. So this is where we end now and we will begin the next time which the notion of simple immediacy. This is where Hegel will begin. So just to summarize what I kind of discussed. So we began discussing the importance and value of Hegel um, and pointing out that, you know, if you don't understand Hegel, you know, it's okay. Just, just read him and see what happens. Try to, try to take some time to think about it. It may make sense just to write down the words look at the form of the word and try to see, does this word say anything to me? Um, sometimes it makes sense to just say, well, when I think, for example, of the word immediacy, which is, by the way, a translation, but is a very good translation, what comes to me, right? I mean, if something is, you might say, I want to have it done immediately. Well, that means at this particular moment with no stop. Um, immediate generally um, refers to right now at this particular time but it also has this emmy need like middle right and me mediation is exactly this middle it's something in the middle that stands between you and the other and immediacy is without this other but take some time think about what do these words mean to you write them down write down the word being and start to look at all the ways you've used the word being and ask yourself well what is being and why, um, why do I use the word so frequently without ever really reflecting on it? Um, what is nothingness? And how do I use the term nothingness? And what role does negativity play in my everyday judgments? I mean, this is going to be a major theme of Hegel. Um, and then we looked at the beginning. Um, and the idea, again, is that you begin with the proper beginning, and from that beginning you can deduce the entire system of thought if you begin from, that is, with the right place. So next time, we'll look at simple immediacy, beginning at page 69 of Hegel's Science of Logic, the A.V. Miller translation, and we'll see what, what Hegel does and where he takes us.